Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a you know great honor to be here. Uh, especially, I want to thank all the, the organizers. Uh, they've done a great job so far. Uh, especially one of the organizers who uh, you, you may you may know, uh, Terence. Uh, I work with Terence at Heroku, and uh, he spent a lot of time working on Bundler. And uh, you know, I use Bundler a lot. Who who, who uses Bundler? Yeah, it's a, it's it's. And everyone, okay, and so um, you know, you know, when you use Bundler, uh, you know, it's bundle this, bundle that, bundle install, bundle update. Uh, so whenever I go to a new version of Ruby or you know, a new environment, I always, you know, I could never get it into my head. They had to do gem install bundle er instead of just bundle, and that just drove me nuts. And so I made um, a gem called Bundle, and all it does is when you install it, it installs Bundler, and uh, <laughs> now. This, this is a couple years ago, and it seems uh, a lot of other people have this problem. Uh, and if you look at the, the code for it, this is it. Like, it's just a gem spec. And so, uh, while it's not maybe, you know, the best uh, gem in the world, probably the most downloads per line of code. So, so I want to start off with that. Um, on, a, on a little bit of a more, well, not, not, not that much more serious, but uh, more uh, meteor topic, uh, so I have a project that I wrote uh, almost two years ago called Git Vein, and uh, the picture there is from what I put in the README, which is a story about uh, the Vein Crow, which if you're not familiar with, like, it's like a parable or like, I don't know if it's actually Aesop, but something like along those lines, where a crow, uh, he's hanging out with his crow friends, and he's like, you know what, I, you know, I don't like these people, and he goes over, he sees these peacocks, he's like, oh man, these peacocks, they're, they're phenomenal, and he's trying to hang out with the peacocks, and they're like, you know, they're, they're okay, but they, you know, they're kind of like not paying attention to him. Uh, and they leave, and he sees a bunch of their feathers on the ground. And so he sticks them on his tail, and he goes to his crow friends. He's like, hey, I don't need you anymore. I'm an awesome peacock. And they're like, uh, all right. And so he goes over to the peacocks, and the peacocks look at him, and they're like, oh, man, this is a really ugly peacock. We should be nice to him. And uh, and he's all like, yeah, look how great I am. And then it's, it's, the, the, the feathers fall off. And uh, then they're like, oh, you, you tricked us, so uh, get lost. And that's that's the end of the story. Um <laughs> And so what I wrote is git vein, and what it lets you do is have uh, make your uh, git shahs and git commits start with like a vanity thing of whatever you want. And uh, I guess I'm the crow. <laughs> anyway, so to know how um, you know to, to know how this works first, you have to look know how a git commit is actually structured. And uh, the way it works is that um, you have a, a tree, and that points a sha of the actual code change. It has a parent, and then the sha of uh, your parent commit, and if it's a merge, there'll be like two or three, depending on what the type of merge it was. Uh, you have your author and committer, and then you have two new lines in your message. And this message is for, um, uh, I was adding uh, Crystal support to Travis CI, and I want to take, I, I'm obligated to give a little bit of a plug to Crystal. It's, if you like Ruby, and you want it to be, you want a compiled language that is statically typed, but fast as hell, and it's all self-hosted, and you can look and get see stuff in like one line, this language is amazing. So if you want to, if you want to hear more about this, come meet me after Afterwards, but I'm not going to turn this into a, a crystal talk. Uh, but anyway, what the so it, what your actual SHA, what it turns up to be, is the um, is taking this commit file and turning it into a SHA. So uh, this particular commit is a real commit, and uh, you can see that I got the prefix to start with cafe. And if you look at it, so if you're going to start brute forcing through commits, you have to look at places where you can change the actual part of the commit. Uh, you can't change the tree. You can't change the parent. Uh, you don't, you don't want to change your name or your email address. And so the only places you have left are either, is either the commit message, uh, or those timestamps of when, uh, when the commit was. So when I was building this, I didn't want to, uh, annoy my coworkers more than I already do. And so I didn't put it at the end of the commit message because that would just put garbage on every single one of my commits. So the only place left was to start screwing around with the timestamps. And so you could either move it, you know, forward second by second or, or previous second by second, and you got two of them to screw around with. Um, so the first version, I wrote it on like a, a long uh, plane ride home, and I got it, you know, kind of working. But it had one problem: um, if you do sort of the naive thing of just putting a loop inside a loop, uh, and like going over, you know, one second over for one of the like the commit date, and then go, you know, positive one second, negative one second, positive two seconds, negative two seconds on the author date, what you end up hitting is like one of these like red dots way up here, which is a valid uh, collision to get your commit to start with cafe, but uh, one of your dates is just like way off by hours. And I really wanted to uh, minimally disrupt the natural order of things and find, you know, to, to really, so I didn't, you know, burden my, my coworkers. And so what I wanted to do was find that, that green dot. And um, 
the way you do that is like by spiraling out in a thing. And I, I spent a long time trying to figure out how to spiral out. But finally, I found uh, down at the bottom, someone figured it out for me, and so I just used their code. So thank you to 2000clicks.com. Um, so getting to like optimization stuff. Um, normally, you know, when I'm working on code, you know, yeah, sure, I've optimized things a little bit, but once it gets fast enough, it's you know sort of irresponsible to keep you know pushing the performance thing. Uh, this already started out irresponsible, and so I could just keep you know diving down on uh, optimizing it. Uh, and uh, like I haven't had the opportunity to needlessly optimize things like ever, so this was actually a lot of fun. Uh, so you know, first thing I did was read it in C, so I could have like real threads, um, and then. Uh, one of the things you can do with SHA is you can like pre-compute stuff and then share that context with the other you know iterations of the loop, and that uh, sped it up like 50%. So I could do uh, what is this uh, like 52 million uh, collision checks from 89 seconds to 59 seconds just by saving the context up until that first timestamp, and so that was pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, another thing that uh, was surprising to me, so I was actually able to start using like some profiling tools, and uh, what I did was, so all these threads are going all at the same time, and I didn't want you know to get like corruption or, or whatever. So uh, when one of the threads found a solution, it would set a global flag saying, "Hey, I found it." And all the other threads, when they would start their work, they would check that and be like, "Oh, nope, someone else found it. I would go away." And actually running a profiler, I found out that that check, just you know checking for that global boolean, was taking up like most of the time after I got rid of some other optimizations. And so by pushing that uh, like lock to only check if the lock is taken before like actually doing the work to change the commit and having all the other threads just be, even if thread A found it, threads B and C will just keep working and uh, it just prevents them from clobbering at the end. And that uh, you know, added another 20% performance. I'm not gonna go into this uh, in detail, but I wanted to show off something cool. Uh, by using C, uh, I was able to find out that this earlier, just using sprintf, was way too slow. And so I ended up you know, tr first trying to use i2a, which takes an integer to a, a character array, and even that was too slow, so I had to like handwrite this so that it would know to use divmod. But the only reason I knew this is because I was using a language uh, that had you know years and years and years of great tooling. So this is, uh, if you haven't checked it out, uh, if, you have an, if you have a Mac, uh, Instruments on OS X, uh, perf is on Linux and it's, it's all right, but this instrument on OS 10 is really cool. You just, you click record and you run your program and then you hit pause and then you get up there, you get like, those are the like actually parts of my program and you can click on it and it dives down to the assembly. You can see like that one assembly instruction was 43%. Uh, and like being able to like see that like was really cool. And I'll give my uh, second plug to Crystal because it does, it looks like Ruby, but it compiles straight down to C. You can do the same stuff, which is really amazing. Um, but, so like, so I've been using this for now two years. Every single commit that I've made, I have screwed with the hash. Like it's just gotten into my, my, my fingers. I do git commit and then I do git bane. Uh, some, some interesting thing is, has come up. Uh, one of them, all my commits start with cafe. Uh, and uh, one of the, and it's really helpful, like if, you, you know, if you're just looking at the commits, you can tell my coworkers, can be like, oh, that's a will commit. You don't even have to look at the author. Uh, one, one thing that was really surprising is that you see that first commit in the screenshot there. Uh, Git already out of the box. If those short shaws, there's going to be a collision. It already adds another one. And I, I don't. Who put that in? Like, what other situation is there going to be for like <laughs> collisions on shaws except for someone screwing around with it like this? So I, I'm glad it's there. Um, but you can also be more expressive with your commits. So one of the things I did was uh, shutting down a project that had, you know it, it was great when it was around, and then it kept being around for a while and just caused a lot of pain. Uh, and so it finally came down to shut it down, and so, I, you know, you can use dead as the shots. You know, you know add, add a little more to your commits. Um, uh, so one of the things I noticed on the main project, one of the main projects that I work on, we were getting really close to commit 1,337, and I was like, I, I can't let this opportunity go to pass. Uh, and so I... I, uh, this is the longest one I've ever searched for. This being, uh, what is that, uh, eight characters. It took maybe like 10 to 20 minutes to find that collision. Uh, but what it was is I took all the comments in, my, in our source code and changed it to be in lead speak. And I, you know, uh, I thought this was pretty good. Like this comment here at the bottom, uh, something like, uh, because the current transaction can in fact surpass the target transaction. Like that's totally readable. Um, they ended up not merging it. 
And they, they didn't give me an explanation, but I think maybe it's because some of our ASCII art, after we uh, put a database into archive mode, it screwed up the, the edge of the, edge of the uh, tombstone there. But we could have fixed that. Uh, but anyway, uh, so one of it, you know, the getting the, the getting of the commit there, that was part of it, but I had to actually make sure that I got that SHA, or that uh, GitHub issue. Uh, the project on the right there was just how to uh, translate all the source codes into uh, LeetSpeak. Uh, someone else's gem who I, sh I should have looked up to thank them. Um, but, you know, this is just sort of like a, a glorified uh, set. On the left, though, this is a very important project that runs and every once a minute or twice a minute checks to see if, you've, if your project has hit issue 1,336. And if it does, then it immediately makes a new issue and then later uh, puts it on to be a pull request. I wanted to do it in two steps there because I, I really didn't want something to go wrong and I didn't like snag that issue. And it was actually really good that I automated it because it happened to be like right during uh, after Heartbleed hit. And so there's a you know a ton of patches going in for like sc people scrambling to try and uh, fix this. So I managed right in the middle of all that people actually working. Like I got this in there. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it uh, brightened their day. Um, but it hasn't always been all good. Um, uh, so this is, uh, you know, the, this is, uh, the guy who made, uh, Crystal, he's like, hey, I noticed, uh, all your commits are kind of screwy. Could you just cut it out? And, uh, so his, his, his reason here was a joke. Like, you know, of course there's going to be enough commits for everyone. Uh, but he's like, you know, I, I'm worried that the tools won't work. And, you know, I sh showed him my other projects and be like, look, you know, like, the tools continue to work. They add the extra letters. He's like, oh, yeah, that's okay. You can do it. But I didn't want to, you know, push any buttons or, like, take it farther. And so after, like, 50 or so commits, I switched from cafe to code. Because uh, I think that's more descriptive. So, I'm, you know, I'm working on code. And uh, maybe if I do a doc patch, I'll use, like, D0C5, the docs. That way you can know. Um, moving on uh, to more uh, GitHub stuff. Uh, pretty soon after GitHub launched their um, commit graph thing, I, you know, I took it. And, you know, honestly, I was like, you know what, I... I don't want people to see how much I work. I don't want, you know, like, you know, whatever, like getting, you know, streaks or whatever. Like, you know, I don't, I don't want that to like, like I want to work when I want to work. I don't want to be motivated by like an external thing. And so I figured uh, if people go to my GitHub profile, you know, they might not notice my name on the left. Uh, they need to, you know, know that, you know, I'm Will. Uh, and so I took, I took this uh, like block diagram, translated into like little X's like that, and then did weird gymnastics to get it because, you know, the dates go down, but I needed to go in one line. And then from that, I had, like, a mask pattern of dates that needed to be on and dates that needed to be off. And as we saw earlier, like, nothing in a git commit is real, so you can just change the date to anything you want. And so I went, like, way back in time and made, like, on any of those on dates, made, like, 20 commits that were, like, through the day that were on, and then off dates, nothing. And went, like, way back in time and then way forward in time and then pushed this one giant repo up that had, like, hundreds of thousands of commits and um, it, it took a little while for GitHub to like parse that through that through, but then what I what I got was my my profile was like that, and it was really nice because over time it would just like sort of marquee across, just be like <laughs> going through. So, so that, that was nice. Um, getting onto more serious topics. Uh, so like you know I, I think you know, the the discussions about people like really fighting hard to have like zero downtime deploys, you know, kind of comes and goes. Uh, a little while ago, it was like in vogue again, like, oh, like, look at all the awesome work we do to have like zero downtime deploys. And I looked at that, I'm like, you know, like, for, sure, for some sites, that's super important. But for like my site, you know, no, for, for your site, you know, does, do you really need zero downtime deploys? Like all the effort that you spend into engineering out, like that solution could probably be spent like fixing up your product. Um, but still, it is pretty, like, I understand, like, it's pretty embarrassing. Like people go to your site and it errors. So what you need to do is take the blame from you and give it to your customers. So you're redirecting that 500, so it's a 30500 to your customer. And so the way you do that is you have a web page that sniffs the browser and then shows the, the your computer can't connect to the internet. And this works. Thank you. So. So this works really well. Um, and also, just uh, uh, coincidentally out of nothing, uh, uh, Tuesday uh, during lunch, one of my coworkers was like, hey, I was going through your, your GitHub and one of your projects, the, the demo site doesn't work. And I was like, are, are you screwing with me? Like, do you, do you know that I'm, I'm giving this talk uh, at Terrence and Richard's conference? They're like, 
no, it's just like the Satan work. I'm like, which one? He's like, the blame one. I'm like, I got, I got you. <laughs> and uh, so actually the way this works is, is, is pretty simple. So you, you go through all the different browsers and you uh, go, go, go to the inspector and pull out the HTML. And then for any of like the assets, like the images or CSS or whatever, uh, base64 encode that so you can inline it. And then base64 encode that whole uh, garbage. And then... So for each browser, there's just one thing that you can just hot load in by replacing the internet HTML of the whole thing. Uh, I think I need to update the, the Chrome one. I think they have like a dinosaur now. So, but like, it's still close enough that people it get so. Um, so, uh, so the, the last thing, the last like big topic uh, that I want to talk about is uh, my professional internet web page. And if my MiFi is working well, let me see if I turned it on. Yeah, all right. Let's see if this if this goes. All right. Where's my fishing? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Would be weird. Yeah. I got. Nice MIDI support. What? So it's pretty good. Um, I'm gonna turn that off. It's hard to concentrate where the MIDI's going. So the reason I did this wasn't just to be silly. Uh, believe it or not, the so like I you know I used to know CSS all right. I've spent five years like doing infrastructure, so I probably can't s still make that claim. But you know, back back then, uh, or not not then then, but back you know five years ago, like I could you know see someone's design and like make it look right. But I I'm not a designer, so I couldn't make anything like original myself. And so what my my web page would always be was just constantly you know like a year or two out of style. And then I would spend a lot of time and I'd update it, and then it would fall out of style, and then it would look you know like a programmer's blog. And then you know I'd, I'd do it again, and you know I figured if I just go back. I'll never have to update it again. And um, and so what I want to do is build it exactly like I would have built a web page um, in that time. Like, you know, I see some some things that try to like, you know, like, oh, we're a GeoCities, th you know, throwback thing. And it's just like animated GIFs in the background and like cursor trails and stuff. Like, like even in 96, I had a little bit more taste than that. So like, this is what, I mean, I'm not saying this is great taste, but this is what it would have been. Um, but there's actually a, a couple of interesting things that I had to do to get this to work. The scrolling marquee there is actually not supposed to do that, but in Chrome it's, it screws it up. If you go to it in Safari or Firefox, it, it, it's a blink tag. Um, and uh, it, the MIDI's, of course, were awesome. And then, unfortunately, um, in one of the, like, Mountain Lion or Snow, I think Mountain Lion, Tim Cook took away MIDI support, so I had to transcode all of my MIDI's to be MP3's. Uh, I left the MIDI's there, so if you're on, like, a, a Linux, you can uh, switch it over to be the actual MIDI's, but they, they sound pretty much the same. Uh, if you can see maybe up, yeah, way up there at the title is marquee across. I wanted to get the status bar to marquee because that was more authentic, but like status bars don't get shown anymore. So I had to go to the title. And, um, for a while, uh, Google would index it after a couple frames of, um, running. So my website title on Google would be like, it fission, will line rubber, but, <laughs> which, which was amusing. Um, yeah, so I want to show, uh, you know, a couple things here. If I can find my cursor. You know what, can I do this? Arrangement, mirror displays. All right, so, so uh, the guest book, I'm using actually someone's guest book thing, and this uh, in inappropriately slashed thing, I didn't type that in, they, they, they still screwed it up like that, which is pretty awesome. Uh, yeah, the hit counter is from a hosted hit counter thing. Um, so one of the things, uh, I'm going to show you how I've done these things, uh, because otherwise there's no way that you can figure it out, because I prevent right-clicking, of course. Uh, so uh, one of the things that was actually uh, a lot of work to get to to get working, so like the reason we all abandoned frames was because you can't deep link into frame content, but I fixed that. So you, you can use frames again. And with, with modern uh, push state, every time I click on a link, uh, the URL bar switches to the thing. And... Um, so that is actually a, a later addition to this, and I, I 
So I have this blog here of mine that's mostly articles from 2008 and then 2010 and then nothing. And I figured the reason that I wasn't writing is because I knew people couldn't deep link to it. So I fixed this deep link problem, uh, but the only thing I, I wrote about was a fight that I had with a raccoon over a long period of time. Um, so I guess it really wasn't, I can't blame it on the deep links. But the deep links do work. So if you like you cap, copy the raccoon thing and go to a new thing, it goes there and it pops all the frames back on. So like, if you want to use frames again, I'm, gonna, I'm about to show you how. Um, <laughs> A side thing, though, with the raccoon story is a couple of my coworkers, they, they read this recently, and they, they're trying to make me believe that there was never a raccoon, that my mom was sneaking down at night and, like, setting off the traps. I, I don't want to believe that. <laughs> so, all right, so back to the... Where's the... Uh, hmm, let's, just, let's just go for it. All right. Um, so this is, if you wanted to... Uh, use Blink now that Blink isn't a tag, and you don't care about Chrome. This, like, if other browsers, this is how it works. So it's a marquee tag that like scrolls off 300 pixels at, at, at a time, and the width is 300 pixels. So it usually looks like it's blinking, and so it would look like this, which is me manually moving the slides because <laughs> Keynote also doesn't have a good Blink. Uh, uh, so I mean, there's there's no moral to any of this stuff, but if you wanted to have a makeup moral, like, don't be afraid to do things yourself. Um, so, so the way that um, the, the frame popping thing works, as I'm, I'm quite proud of, uh, so you add a, a global variable to just window, calls index, is, is index, and then that second uh, junk there is how I do the, the scrolling marquee title. And then you have your, your good old frame sets. And uh, I normally don't type HTML things in all caps, but I figured for frame sets, I should do it in all caps. So that, that, felt, that felt appropriate. Um, and then on the other pages, this top uh, bit of JavaScript you do, and you check to see if uh, the window is top, and I'll forgive you if you don't, aren't, re don't remember that that's the property for if you're the top frame, because you know you probably haven't used frames in a long time. And then you, you check if you're not the index, uh-oh, you know, we need to pop all the frames back on. Uh, there's another template thing in, in there, and then you use that same trick from redirect blame to just write out the entire uh, inner HTML of, of the overall document. And then later on, you just annotate all your frames with a uh, little code to do the push state. And that works really well. Um, and that's everything with Bitvision. And the final thing I want to leave, leave you with is the most evil thing that I've ever done. And that's this one line method. And, and, and so, so what this does is, so there's a callback hook anytime a method is defined in Ruby. And a very low percentage of the time, what this does is it immediately undefines the method. <laughs> and so you, you put this in your uh, soon-to-be former friend's code base. And <laughs> when they run the tests, everything's probably fine. When they run the tests again, one test fails, uh, 100 tests fails, or they all fail, depending on what gets pulled out. And when they're, when they're scratching their head and they're like, oh, let me rerun that in isolation, it's going to be fine. Because a different, <laughs> a different method gets undefined. It's almost impossible to track down, except if you get unlucky and undefined initialize. Ruby has this helpful warning saying that it might cause serious problems. Uh, there are serious problems. And so if, if you want to be a little bit more uh, uh, crafty, you can make sure that you don't undefi undefined initialize, and then it'd be really hard to track down. And uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.